Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Paul. I'm a scientist here at the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about a platform that we've been developing here um, over the past few years um, using automation to perform stem cell research. Uh, so the title of today's talk is Toward Large-Scale Functional Genomic Studies Through the Use of Automation um, of Induced Pluripotent Stem Cells Expansion and Their Differentiation. So for the, those of you that don't know us, uh, the New York Stem Cell Foundation has been around a little over a decade now. Um, and the major aim of our foundation is to accelerate, the cures, uh, accelerate cures for the major diseases of our time through stem cell research. Um, and we've been able to do that in three different ways. Um, so we set out to uh, establish ourselves within the global scientific community by not only providing uh, funding, and so we do that to in uh, innovators, uh, such as fellows and postdoctoral investigators, and the RFAs for those uh, open throughout the year, um, as well as um, our outreach. And so we host a conference every year, as well as symposia throughout the year. Um, but what's different than most foundations is that we have um, a research institute. And so here at the Research Institute, we have disease-focused teams working on areas such as neurodegeneration, diabetes, and orthopedics. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today as well is our robotics. And so we have a big robotic platform, um, as well as a scaled stem cell biobank uh, that's available to the, to the wider community as well. Um, NICEF has been able to fund people all over the world. So uh, wherever you are in the world and that you're looking for funding, do feel free to go onto our website and take a look at the, uh, the RFAs that are live. Uh, we've been able to, like I said, fund people um, really across the globe. Um, a little over a couple of years ago now, we moved down to a brand new facility. Um, and so uh, we are uh, now in central Manhattan um, in, a, in a fully dedicated research uh, institute. Um, where we have all the facilities that we need to be able to do to perform uh, stem cell research. At the foundation, we focus on a number of different disease areas, so things like bone regeneration, diabetes, heart disease, and a whole spectrum of different neural disorders from autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, MS, and schizophrenia. And we've had a pretty strong publication record as well. Over the past 10 years, we've been able to put out papers uh, covering everything from uh, the prevention of uh, transmitting mitochondrial disease, uh, modeling Alzheimer's, um, as well as uh, working the neural area on Parkinson's disease and, and generation of protocols such as those for deriving microglia. As I said, though, um, the reason why I'm speaking today uh, is because of the, the platform that we've been able to build over the past few years. I think when IPS cells first came to, uh, came, came to be known, um, it was pretty quickly realized that they'd be an excellent model for obviously modeling human, human disease. Um, and so when you look at how human disease is sort of looked at, especially in the modern age, quite typically we're looking at uh, sequences and we're, then we're looking at genomes, and we're trying to make genomic and medical interpretations from, from the genetics. Eventually that leads back then to um, the diagnosis or the treatment of a particular condition. And this has been great. And so GWAS studies have been tremendously beneficial in, in elucidating the roles of different genetic variation um, to endpoint phenotypes. And so an example here, um, you know, this could be any particular um, Manhattan plot, but this one here is for type 2 diabetes. And you can see here a whole range of different genes that are associated uh, with the onset of type 2 diabetes. And it's great. There's a whole bunch of genes here that um, are well known to be associated with um, sort of pathways involved in, um, in insulin and, and metabolism and things like that. However, it also elucidates different genes. Uh, and to, to date, we still don't really know their function or the role and the, and the role of these polymorphisms within the onset of these diseases. And yet, to get to this point, it's taken many thousands of samples and thousands of people to, um, to analyze these data sets and get us to a point where we have an understanding, but we don't yet have a complete picture. And so perhaps uh, using stem cell technology, we can improve this understanding. This is a paradigm that probably many people listening are familiar with, where we've taken skin biopsies or, or even blood, and you can reprogram these cells back into induced pluripotent stem cells, grow them in culture, and then you can turn those into really any cell type you like, so long as you have a good enough protocol. Once you have that cell type, um, you can then obviously begin to screen candidate drugs um, to identify things that could go back into the clinic. Um, obviously, we can also tie together then genetics as well, and using things like CRISPR, we can um, make isogenic controls, and we can do lots of advanced now science uh, just in the dish. However, and for many of you, I'm sure you're familiar, it takes an awful lot of work to be able to do this kind of work. It takes a lot of uh, hours in a tissue culture hood. Um, it's hard to work with large numbers of cell lines, typically, uh, just because of the uh, quite intense culturing conditions that stem cells require. And so we set out to 
to really try and understand how would we be able to get to the same point as genetic studies where they're using thousands of people, um, but be able to do that with, with biological samples, with actual cells. And so one of the questions that we sort of started out with is sample size. You know, at what scale should we be using IPS-derived models to really accurately improve our biological understanding? But that introduces a whole question on its own, and that is at what scale can we use these IPSCs without really hitting any technical barriers? And so if you look at the hurdles that are involved in IPSC work, um, they are quite numerous. So you can have all sorts of variation, variation that stems from, uh, from the donor itself, so the sex of the person, their ethnicity, the age at which you collect them, and obviously their health status. Um, things within the samples themselves, once you've been able to, say, derive even a somatic cell or then an IPS cell, it will depend on how you've reprogrammed those cells, how you're growing them, which media you're using, which basement matrix, um, and obviously things like growth rates of the cell lines as well. There's obviously a lot of technical variation that come in from just doing routine science, consistency in your passing, passaging. Are you using similar split ratios every passage? Are you consistently plating the same number of cells? Are you, are you just doing things the same day every day? Um, and most likely, because I've been a scientist using, use, doing cell culture in a hood, I know that this often doesn't happen. And then finally, right at the end of this, it's great having the cells and great being able to differentiate the cells, but what if ultimately then your readout is inconsistent and you don't have a robust readout that's that's occurring the same way every time, even in your control samples. And so what we wanted to do was get to a point where we could sort of enable uh, power, basically. How do you bring power to these studies? And how do you mitigate the hurdles that we've just described? Well, here at the New York Stem Cell Foundation, we decided to establish something called the Global Stem Cell Array. Um, here, we've got an end-to-end -end process that we've been able to develop in-house for the collection of uh, patient, uh, donor samples, so everything from skin biopsies or blood samples, through to the endpoint uh, distribution of those samples. So we've got a, a, been able to collect samples um, with uh, consent forms and IRB approved protocols, and we can do this across multiple sites. We then bring those starting samples into the lab, and we can um, now, with our robotics, be able to produce IPS cells from them, differentiate them, and, and, use, and perform genome editing as well. And we've got pretty strict SOPs, and we've got a great limb system here, um, and those samples then become banked so that they can be distributed uh, to researchers. And so for both um, academic and commercial applications, we are able to distribute those cell lines um, to the wider scientific community. And one of the questions is, why did we switch to automation? Uh, why, why did we use this from, from the beginning? Well, I think when you start looking at how to, how to make a stem cell line, um, if you think about it uh, just as a, as a process, it seems pretty simple. You know, you take a biopsy, um, you maybe perform some, some assays on the cells that you're deriving from the biopsy, but you can start to establish a small fibroblast bank. From there, you can grow those fibroblasts, reprogram them into stem cells, um, and then grow those stem cells up and begin performing experiments on them. Like I said, in theory, that seems very simple, and for a, for a small number of samples, um, it's, it's totally practical. But when you start thinking about how to do large panels and large batches of cell lines, and you break down each and every step, you actually begin to realize just how many steps there are. And when you're trying to drug, juggle many of these things in parallel, it either requires a very large number of people to be able to do this, or alternative solutions. And so for us, we switch to automation. And so now you'll see sort of in this video exactly how we're able to do that. So this video uh, will illustrate uh, the NICEF Global Stem Cell Array uh, that we use for our IPS production. Uh, here you can see uh, the automated incubators that we have. The system here operates under quarantine conditions for the initial somatic cell uh, isolation. Uh, the systems can passage the cells, uh, feed them. We have the automated images, as you just saw, that can track the fibroblast growth. Um, we next move on to a cluster of three systems that performs uh, the cell thawing, uh, the subsequent uh, growth, passaging, uh, and then uh, reprogramming process. Um, and we can then uh, cherry pick and, and array cell lines um, in 96 or plates. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about uh, some of the uh, systems that we have for separating stem cells from non reprogrammed cells. Um, and finally, once we have uh, finished the reprogramming, pro reprogramming process, uh, we can then uh, move on to uh, array the cell lines in 96 wall plates, uh, continue their expansion, uh, passes them into EVs for uh, continued uh, QC analysis at the, as, as EVs, um, and then we can freeze the cells uh, back down in, in, in matrix tubes or within plates um, for, uh, for subsequent uh, experimentation uh, later in the process. 
And so a couple of years ago now, we were able to uh, publish this in Nature Methods, describing the, the development of this system. Um, obviously, since then, we've gone on to, uh, to make a number of developments, and I'll talk about some of those in a moment. Um, but this was the basic underlying uh, principle of, of what we had done, as you saw in the video. Um, those entire processes, just being able to automate each of those individual steps has been, uh, was enormously time consuming and, and required a lot of uh, backwards and forwards between engineers and scientists. And I think one of the powers of, of the foundation now has been bringing those different disciplines together. Um, scientists certainly think uh, slightly differently to maybe the way engineers do, and being able to bring those groups of people together um, and be able to produce something like this platform has been uh, a tremendous success here. When you look at the actual data that came out of the, uh, out of the publication, um, I'm not going to go through everything now and feel free to, uh, to, to go and look at the, the manuscript, um, but we're able to see ultimately the, at the end of it that we did see quite a significant reduction in the variation um, in, in terms of differentiation that we were seeing um, in cell lines that were produced under automation uh, versus those that had been manually derived or colony picked, thing, things like that. And so ultimately, what, was, what, we, what we think we see as the progression of, of this sort of system is, is the development of, of these end user sites. So obviously, um, setting up a big facility to just produce IPS cells, well, we realize that not everywhere is going to need to do that. Um, there only uh, needs to be the continual production of so many lines. But the distribution and then use of those lines, that, that has to happen. Um, and so how do people in their own labs be able to handle lots of cell lines in parallel. And so we're starting to see the upswing of, of the use of robotics within laboratories, and we really see that end user sites um, will soon start being able to do it, uh, in, in ways that will be uh, accessible um, these sorts of experiments on large numbers of cell lines within their own labs or, or perhaps core facilities. So since producing uh, the automated platform, like I said, it's gone through a number of steps of refinement and improvement. Um, over the past few years, there's been a particular focus on blood reprogramming, um, just overall increasing the throughput. Um, and we spent a lot of time building um, a lot of software backend. Um, we found that in building sort of this custom platform, um, a lot of the out-of-the-box solutions for limb systems just um, weren't really applicable and, and, and weren't able to, to fit into what we wanted to do here. So we brought in-house a software team, and we've developed a, a pretty comprehensive um, software system as the back end to all of this. Um, in addition, as, CRISPR, as things like CRISPR-Cas9 have continued to rise in, in popularity, um, wanting to build out a way to perform genomic modifications at scale has been something we've spent a lot of time working on. Um, so the idea of being able to transfect either lots of different lines or the same line with lots of different guide RNAs um, and then derive uh, stable either isogenic or knockout cell lines is now something we were able to do um, using, again, the, the robot robotics that we have here. With that said, it does illustrate, though, um, where although having the robots makes things a lot easier, um, there's still a lot of hurdles to overcome. So if you think about something like monoclonalization, uh, where we want to produce just a, a single cell line that's come from a single cell, which is critical when doing uh, isogenic corrections, um, we're able to plate ourselves um, into, uh, into 96 well plates and see uh, the outgrowth of colonies. So after about two weeks, you see this, uh, this wonderful colony here that's, that's looking pretty, pretty nice. Um, and we're able to go back in time um, and start to see, um, it may be a little hard to see, but it's sort of within the center of your screen uh, where the colony came from. And if we go back to day one and zero, and you're going to struggle here, I appreciate that, um, and, and back to day zero, Finding the original cell that it came from can be a real challenge. Um, is there one cell there? Are there two cells there? Um, in this particular picture, the cell is actually right in the middle, even though uh, it might be difficult to see on your screens. And so, you know, this is a very tough problem to solve, uh, especially when you have lots of wells to look through and lots of plates and, and different, different cell lines. And so one of the things we've spent a lot of time more recently doing is trying to use uh, machine learning and, and, and AI approaches to see if we can identify, track the colonies using these machine learning algorithms, um, as well as go back to the single cell and have these identify uh, single cells. And so using these convolutional neural networks, we've been able to do that to, to come some, some success, some quite good success, actually, um, being able to identify uh, colonies in, in either very busy, very dirty images. It can still successfully identify them all the way down to things like the single cell. And so as we get to there, we want to start thinking beyond reprogramming and, and putting the cells to use uh, outside of just having made some cell lines or corrected some cell lines. What else do you want to be able to use with them? And I think one of the things that we started to see as we began to use our cells in, in differentiation protocols um, 
was whether we could use machine learning to guide uh, and optimize the use of differentiation protocols. One of the things we've seen here is that there, you know, there's a wide variety of different protocols. If any of you have gone out to sort of start a differentiation, it can be a little bit a case of, well, where do I start? Um, because there are so many different people saying that there are all these different ways of producing uh, this, the end cell type that you might want. What we've seen, though, is that a lot of these protocols tend to overfit to the cell line with which they were created. So it could be that they were tested on one or five or maybe 10 cell lines, but as soon as you start expanding that beyond, the protocols can start to fall apart a little bit. Um, the cells just behave very differently um, uh, once, once you expand your donor pool. And so trying to solve this problem has been something we've been doing it, uh, to, to some degree. And ideally then, this would speed up the discovery of, of the ideal differentiation protocol, and you could really hone in on what you want uh, from the beginning. And so the paradigm we've been using to do this has been to sort of use design of experiment approaches. Um, so um, putting the cells into, uh, into arrays of, of, of samples, uh, and then performing the automated differentiation of these, uh, looking at the results, having good optimized data readouts that we can rely on, and are, like I said, able to be reproduced time and time again, plug that data back into um, uh, software or an algorithm, look at what it's saying next to do, and then perform those modifications. Eventually you go back to the beginning and you keep going round and round until you come up with the ultimate optimized differentiation protocol. And rather than having had that done on one cell line or three cell lines, we're doing this on batches of 24, 48, 96 cell lines at a time uh, to be able to, um, to really optimize this as, as quickly as we can. And so now um, we've been able to platform a number of different protocols onto the, onto the robotics and do this reproducibly. And so we're really getting to this point now where we can take disease and control cohorts, put them into the same plates or across multiple different plates, uh, generate the kind of cell types we want to get readouts from, and then be able to analyze the cellular phenotype at the end of it. Ultimately now we're able to train and then test uh, different models with on, on these cells. And so it allows us to take protocols that have been generated in the lab, uh, as well as those that have come in externally, and do this across multiple cell lines. So we've been able to platform things like the use of glutamatergic and GABAergic neurons onto the platform, uh, using both small molecule and NGN2-driven uh, approaches, um, and now beginning to optimize more and more of the oligodendrocyte, the microglia, and certainly the organoid work that we're seeing more and more of in the field. And so this platform we really think sets us up to be able to perform research at a very large scale. We have a number of active collaborations uh, where we've produced both cell lines for collaborators, as well as then differentiating and producing the material that will ultimately go into large RNA sequencing experiments. Um, so we're quite excited about where this platform's headed. Um, if you want to reach out for any more information, please do feel free to do so. Uh, and so finally, this brings me to acknowledging all the folks that have helped uh, make this platform possible. Um, I stand. Uh, I, I talk in front of you today uh, as really just one member of a giant team of people that have helped to bring this together. Uh, and the folks listed here really only represent a snapshot in time of, of, of an enormous number of people that have over the years helped contribute to, to the development of this platform. Um, we're, we're very proud of what we've developed here and, and quite excited about what it, uh, what it holds for, for the future of stem cell research. Um, so that's it for me today, uh, and I look forward to answering your questions via email uh, right now.